He is an agrarian intellectual activist who is honored to walk in the footprints of his ancestors and continue the work of helping the long arc, I believe, the long arc of the universe as it bends towards justice. Um, he has been involved in all the social justice movements of the past 60 years and seeks to contribute to the theory and practice of creating sustainable and just communities. He is also an expert on and has some personal connections with George Washington Carver, which is why he's here tonight. Yes. And I want to welcome our mayor, well, your mayor, I live in Paris, sorry. Um, <laughs> but to come up as well, I believe there's some sort of officially something that's going to happen. So. Yes, yes. There you go. I'm
everybody. Try to put a few down. You know, one four. Put your arms up, whatever. It's kind of relaxed. And kind of get centered. Relax the thoughts. We've been busy all day and we've come here for this crazy gap. Which we don't be talking. So uh, it's kind of like. Um, Take a few deep breaths, you know how you breathe and you breathe in. All the way in. Deep breaths out. It's not just the human people 
need to be free. It's the animal people, the plant people, the water people, the air people, the rock people, the fire people, that we as humans are also responsible for, if you will, our stewardship over. And we're doing a poor job of that. So I'm saying we want to free all of the people. I am um, especially honored to be here tonight at the invitation of the Scott County Public Library. Had all kinds of help along the way. My friend Key Lane here and Bias Stilford, who, who, who uh, couldn't get tonight. He's going through chemotherapy. So he's going to lift Bias up with healing thoughts along the way. You know, my um, I'm humble of Howard and Bama Martin and their children, Rodney, Brian, and Dana, lived here for some 20 some odd years. And, uh, so I have a lot of long traditions, if you will, in the um, Scott County, Georgetown community. I have to be back, and I want to thank all the library staff, uh, the brother who's back here uh, filming and videotaping for future use, and all the other staff, you know, uh, who lend, lend a hand. You know, Wesley Melissa who worked, we've been, this has been planned since last September, believe it or not. And we've got Facebook Live going, we've got live video, we've got you know, all things going on. Uh, I'm an OG trying to keep up all the technology, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, so again, I've been asked to um, talk about Carver and Gardner. And it would take several months, not an hour to just touch on his gardening work. Because again, he was at Tuskegee for fi almost 50 years. And before that, his life began in the garden. It would take months. So the, uh, the question is, like, who is this guy Carver? You know, who is this guy? I've spent, in studying intensely the last 12 years, studying intensely the heart. I'm still finding stuff out about him. His life was so magnanimous. You know, we as, as humans, we're like trees, okay? We're all like trees and forms. We all have a function. Some might be, you know, a dogwood tree, sassafras tree, maple tree, oak tree, pine tree. But some of us are destined to be these redwood, asparian, huge trees, taller than Empire State Building. But we're all trees. We all have a function. I maintain carpet was like one of those tall, Redwood trees. But what we have done in the last 80 years, we've whitewashed it. We know him as a peanut wizard, and we kind of like narrowed his scope of life to be the peanut wizard. But if we compare the peanut to the acorn, because Carver also studied and worked and wrote about acorns. He wrote about, about everything I can think of, to tell you the truth. But here's how we view Carver in this tree. As a single acorn. That's how we view Carver. But if we take Carver as an elephant, <laughs> okay, and we use this 500 year old Newtonian Cartesian view of the world, then when we're around with his, his tail, we say, oh, it's a snake. Or if we're up near where his ears, we say, it's a fan. 
or if we're around in a tusk, oh, it's a spear. <coughs> or his trunk is a snake. Our feet like a tree. His body is a wall. But we know an elephant is more than just his tail. And carver is a lot more than the peanut. I mentioned this way of thinking that arose about 500 years ago that guides all of our thinking. We're all trained that way to think, view the world in this Newtonian, Cartesian view of the world of things being separate, dichotomized, not related, not connected. We guide government. We create school curriculum. It's upon this way of thinking. But the guy here, he wasn't too bad of a smart guy, from what I've heard. Einstein. And Einstein said we can't solve our problems with the same way of thinking that we use to create them. How often does a mayor and a council and staff sit around and say, well, what does that mean to rethink as we're trying to do government? How do we undo that way of thinking of separate departments of government, separate curricula? That's what Einstein said. And by the way, Carver, Einstein, Edison, they were all friends. <coughs> Do you know that? They were all friends. Einstein and Edison said of Carver, they said he was the greatest scientist of our era. That's what they said about him. They didn't just say he was a peanut. So I maintain, I'm going to try in my talk this evening to give you a, a sense of Carver as an acorn tree with thousands of acorns. I can't do it only one hour. I'm going to give you some, some highlights of the various acorns that Carver laid out for us. Now, if you, get to, if you do a Google search of Carver quotes, he has a bunch of them, and they all make sense. But one of my favorites is right, this one right here, where he says, through a flower, we can see infinity. Now, in the schools, that kids go to, that your kids went to. Do they learn that? I don't think so. How to see infinity in the flower. You know, if you, if you go online and do a, again, a search, don't believe me, I'm lying Jim from, you know, Madison County. What do I know? If you see pictures of him, he's usually always wearing a flower. That's what he reminds himself, like, you mentioned earlier about this divine wisdom, divine force. But see, we teach it as something of not just way over there, way out there, way up there. We don't teach the flowers, the nuts, the corn, the rocks. <coughs> Our divine vibration. But Carver understood that. He was speaking quantum science. <coughs> so my effort is to, to try to establish that for Carver, the garden was everywhere. It wasn't simply there at Tuskegee in his own yard. The garden was everywhere. And he brought us, what he brought us was this magnificent example of systems thinking, quantum thinking. Even though we oftentimes give credit to fine to Einstein, Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Madame Curie. But Carver was not just developing in a laboratory, he was exercising it every day in his life. <coughs> so let's take Carver's quote about this idea of seeing infinity. 
of what we call the universe, the cosmos, the galaxies. He oftentimes spoke about the cosmos, the infinity. But see, that industrial age, with all the ambient light, we don't spend much time anymore just looking up. I would say the reason why Harry Tubman could return to the South 30 plus times and escape and never get caught, because she understood the form of the she knew which way the moss grew. She knew what about to guide the fort of the North Star. She knew about the sun setting and, and whatever. She understood the cosmos as a way to provide freedom for so many people. There's a still a need for us to connect with the cosmos. Now, they said that almost 14 million years ago, Think of the Big Bang blew out, that blew out stardust, blew out God force, blew out divine light. 14 million years ago, we call it the Big Bang. You know, I'm a guy, guy I don't like that kind of term. It's too masculine. It sounds too destructive. Big Bang. You know how we mean it. We gotta get something, you know, we gotta do something with that kind of a force. I prefer the term the big seating. The big seating. Which means that the stardust blew out. Now I think, Brother Jenkins, I'm not really about to tell like you are. I think it talks about somewhere there in Genesis <coughs> and other sacred texts. The Quran. Quran. All of all sacred texts. This idea of life forming. Creation, we call it. The big seeding, which means the garden just didn't begin with carbon and peanuts, and this much larger since of the cosmos. So, if we did that, then we would then have these images of planets, galaxies, nebula as seeds. Okay? And then we would have in the middle this labyrinth which represents life force. It represents, at a human level, the woman's fallopian tubes, the inner ear, the cochlea. So it's like sacred geometrical forms here, this labyrinth. But what it does, I think it gives, for me, a more nurturing, mothering, feminine connotation to this thing called creation. So in Carver's view, his garden was the earth. Carver understood that the garden of Eden was right here on the earth. He didn't teach it would be in heaven. He taught it was right here on earth was his garden and how he applied himself. He taught the earth was mother. He taught about moving away from the sense of homocentric view of the world to one that is earth-centric. Now, I pull quotes from all kinds of folk, but one of my favorites is from T.C. Allen. He says, humankind is, has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. <clears throat> Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. That's the wisdom of one science. It's the wisdom of most all spiritual traditions. We've just forgotten how to practice those traditions. And Tar Carver helps remind us and teach us these principles. So in my view that Carver is like this guidepost to the future. We can reach back read about, understand, create plays, create rap tunes, create library sessions, together what we can to create this, social, this socially just, sustainable future. So my point is, with the library staff, when it comes to the innovations in the garden, we have to have this earth-centric view of what that means.
And how then do we go about our lives looking at the, at the garden? But we realize that with North Washington Carver, we got to put it into context. I just leave him out there on a tree. We have to understand this episode, this episodic human tragedy, this human experience of where Europeans went to Africa, captured people, enslaved people, took them across the Atlantic, spread folks all over the Americas and parts of the world. Because Carver saw his work as how did he respond to the contradictions of this kind of Holocaust in his time. And still today, still today, we're working on dealing with those contradictions. Which means that our country was founded upon what we call stolen land from indigenous people, stolen labor from African people, dispossession, displacement. This was at, so this was our country's foundation of injustice. Land and labor to do what? To do agriculture. That's where injustice was founded. But food and agriculture isn't just the foundation of injustice. It represents, Brother Mayor, Kenny, everybody else, it represents a fulcrum point of transformation, a pivot point of transformation. If we can begin to resolve the various contradictions within food and agriculture, we can then begin to apply those to other institutions. Because of African enslavement doing agriculture, we still treat people who do the agricultural work the worst. The women get oppressed, harassed the worst, the lowest paid, no retirement, no benefits because of this legacy. So we realize as well that one of the primary crops and products during those years of enslavement was around cotton. It was a global trade of cotton. Folks made millions of dollars from selling cotton. If you work some a people for 200, 300 years for free, a lot of money gets made. A lot of existing companies now, a lot of universities, a lot of businesses. You got a Harvard that's kind of rich, Princeton, Yale. Backtrack, and they're now saying, well, yeah, you know, we made lots of money in this, these situations right here. Pictures of folks carrying cotton on their heads. But part of the point of this carbon connection that it wasn't just people who made this journey across the Atlantic, <clears throat> okay? It was also lots of foodstuffs. Foods from the Americas went to Europe, went to Asia, went to Africa. And foods from Europe, Asia, Africa came to the Americas. Think about kids, um, Italy is known for pasta. Where did it come from? China. They're known for pasta and tomato. Where did it come from? The Americas. Over Europe, they're great. Uh, uh, they use chocolate a whole lot. Some of the finest chocolate you can buy in Europe comes from the Americas. But also, a whole host of things came from Africa. And one thing that came to the Americas was a peanut. I have up here some raw peanuts. We got some things back in the back of some, some free seeds over here, some of our Ujama seeds. If you, uh, before you leave, come up, take a few, they're raw, which means you can go home and plant these bad boys and say, Brother Carver, we're honoring you with the kids are planting peanuts. They're here for you. Now, where did the peanut come from? It came from the South America. The Spanish came over. Okay, to South America, began taking all kinds of stuff, you know, chocolate and coffee, you know, and peanuts, and took them to Europe. But the Europeans didn't like peanuts. You know, didn't like them. But what they did, that's why we have Carver now, working on peanuts. They took them to Africa. 
And African folk just love some peanuts. <laughs> they just knew, they said, well, we're going to take these peanuts, we're going to plant them, you know, we're going to honor them, you know, we're, we're going like, to really work with them because one day, you know, our great grandkids are going to be at a soccer game or a baseball game and need to eat some toasted peanuts. <laughs> some boiled peanuts. So we gotta be, we got to have things ready for them six generations from now. So, but that's the travel of this peanut. So there are various products that came from Africa, okay? Uh, you know, this, this is here, rice, okra, black-eyed peas, cassava, yams, beans, millet, sorghum, watermelon, coconut nuts, sesame, banana, and peanuts. Now, part of the journey of African people coming to this country, this question of food. Some of the women, when they were rounded up, didn't know where they were going, would take seeds, okra seeds, sesame seeds. Had the bottom number two. Had them in the braids, rice and bring it to the Americans. So, Carver was in tune with these ancestral vibrations. The travel of the peanut. His ancestral grandmothers carried the seeds with him. He connected with them. So in the South, Carver had two primary senses of mission. First, it was a peanut. One was to have say black soils, the soils that were undernourished, were being damaged by this one crop, cotton. Dust bowls were being created. Folks couldn't make a living because the soil had been burned out with this cotton. Overproduction. Carver came in and introduced peanut, the cowpea, other legumes, two potatoes, to nourish the soils. But his job was to save the soils in the South. It's also his job was, his work was, his mission was to save the black souls in the South. Some historians say that he saved the South from collapse, agricultural, social collapse. Which means if the South had collapsed, the country would have collapsed. It's worth thinking about. It. But we call him the peanut wizard. Now here's just a few. You know, he, uh, as we know, and you all know about some of his life, you know, he's regarded as having uh, introduced or developed some 300 products out of peanut. Some 180 from the soybean, 150 from the cowpea, many more from the sweet potato. But you wonder, how did this man create 300? Now here's his story. And kids, this is for you all in particular. So Carver, you know, went to Iowa State, got his bachelor's, his master's degree, Ken Tuskegee, and he was talking to God. <coughs> I said, God, look here. I'm a bad boy. Okay? I got a bachelor's. I got a master's. I'm the first poet boy to come out of Iowa State. I'm a bad boy. So what I want you to do, God, is give me the secrets to life and the universe. God said, man, you know, we've been hanging out for a long time, okay? I like you, little brother. But what you're asking is big boy stuff, big girl stuff. Okay? That's for the big people. You're a little guy. You can't handle this other stuff. But what I will do, because you've been right with me 
your whole life. What I will do, I will allow you to communicate with the peanut plant. And if you come to her humbly, if you come to her a sense of reverence, she'll talk back to you. And then she will reveal all of her secrets. That's what Carver said. Yeah. That's talking about Carver and guarding innovations. When, you, when we go over to the UK Extension Office, or if we go to other places where they do gardening, do they tell you to talk to the plants? Do they help you understand how to do that? How to look deep into the cloud? That's what Carver said. And here's what, you know, if you read some of the articles in the newspaper, New York Times, you know, call him a hoax. They ridicule him. The man that talks to flowers. That's unheard of. That's what he said. Now, one of the um, reasons why he became known so widely around peanuts is because in 1921, he was asked by the U.S. peanut industry to go to the House Ways and Means Committee to talk about how important the peanut crop was for the U.S. mostly southern agricultural industry because the House was getting ready to open up to the world supply of peanuts into the United States like we do now. We call it free trade, which means our workers lose out, no jobs, you can't get chips, they're, all, they're made all overseas. But anyway, he said, well, yes, I'll go. I, I will go to uh, Washington, D.C. and um, speak on behalf of the peanut that was, that was so dear to him. He spent the last 20 years, since 1900, studying the peanut. He was like the expert, if you will, at that time, <coughs> in peanuts. So he goes in, you know, like here, to the house chamber, and he, he, like here, he brought a whole bunch of stuff with him. You know, things he had made from the, from the peanut plant, peanuts, the vine, you know, stories. Big table full of stuff, he came in. Now, at that time, you can imagine who the house members were. There were no women in there. No people of color. 1921, it was all white men. Cool. That's the way it was. <clears throat> they said, okay, uh, next on the agenda. And the, uh, is he here? George Deborah Carver. Carver walks up, you know, and sits down, and the stuff out. Because it's an actual hearing, it's all in public record. It's all part of congressional record. Okay? They said, Okay, boy. You hear the test by about ten? Yeah, I'm here. Sir. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, oh, boy. He said, yes, sir, I'm here. Oh, boy, you got ten minutes. What you got to say? So he began talking about the peanut, and he barely got the first few sentences in. The chairman said, "And by the way, boy, you're bringing a wall down with you."
he was spellbound. He had all his stuff, you know, and he was speaking very politely, you know, and he knew all the stuff. So I said, okay, boy, you got uh, 10 more minutes. Come on, come on, 10 more minutes. Public record. Don't believe me. You know, go to Google. He was there an hour and a half. Hour and a half. He achieved what he went after. Big Pets of Terror. Um, incoming peanuts. And he literally stayed the south. Now, part of his context as well is this whole notion of enslavement and the buying and selling of people. <coughs> that went on. Matter of fact, I'll bet you right here at the courthouse, he's got cabin. They were buying and selling people. They were in Lexington called Seaside. Every courthouse. Get that. Pretty much. What's important here is that when his mother was 13 years old, she was sold to Moses and Susan Carter. 13 years old. Father Giles was as well. Later on, they got older. They had three children. This was part of his life. Now, of course, we, we, we experienced a terrible civil war that was thought to resolve the contradiction I spoke about earlier. Stolen land, stolen labor. Civil war was fought. Terrible war. I do um, talks on Juneteenth as well. I maintain that the introduction of some 200,000 African American troops, men and women, the of the Civil War. And Juneteenth ought to be not just Emancipation Day, it ought to be Reunification Day. Because what, that, what happened was the country was reunified. Because it was called Juneteenth. It's another whole separate lecture. So, somewhere around 1864, Carver, his mother, his sister and brother, of course, were living on this um, farm in Down, Missouri, um, owned by Moses and Susan Carver. His father died in a farm accident before he was born. When he was about one year old, not sure yet, just what year he was born and how old he was, but about one year old, some night raiders came in to the farm to steal from the slave folk. They grabbed Carver, who was about one year old, grabbed his mother and his sister, and his brother ran and hid out. And they took him out. They took him away. And what the story says, they came to Kentucky. So Brother Jenkins here might be part of Carver's family, OK? I don't know. Well, some of us might be part of the family because his mom and his daughter came to Kentucky. So what happened, the uh, Moses who owned them sent out one of his neighbors with a horse hoping to fetch him back. His friend rode and rode to, 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 to find them and all he could find was, was George Carver. Couldn't find the mother, couldn't find the sister. So Carver, whose father died before he was born, <laughs> now lost his mother. So when you hear folks saying, the song, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Long way from home. They're singing these kind of stories. These kind of stories. But for Carver, in his garden, in his home, his home became this farm 
He was born on but not his father, not his mother. But his brother was there. So Moses and his wife Susan raised George and James like they were his own kids. So in other newspaper articles about Carver, sometimes you'll see these kind of headlines. The Carver was the boy who was traded for a horse. The point is that we're thankful for Moses and Susan Carver. You know, part of the story about their life is that they reluctantly became owners of Giles and Mary. Another farmer owed them a big debt. Only way to pay it was through two people. So they reluctantly accepted that. Now, Moses Carver and his wife came from Springfield, Illinois. Y'all might know somebody else. Came president of Springfield. So Moses and his wife were new Abraham Lincoln and were inspired by his principles and values, especially around being an abolitionist. So here's kind of a replica of what their cabin looked like. They're in Diamond, Missouri. I was in Diamond last summer on my, what's called my Joy and Justice journey in June. I stopped by Diamond, Missouri. It's the Carver National Monument. And this kind of a cabin is there on the grounds. That's where Moses and Susan Carver and James and George lived. So like, of course, Carver was called Carver's George. Carver's George. Then later on in his life, a friend named Mariah Watkins said, well, you know, like, let's be quiet, you keep saying, you're Carver's George. Okay. Let's get a name for you. So he twisted up, George Carver. He had a W because he was in Kansas, he would get confused with somebody else in the same city, the same name, George Carver. He had a W. People thought he meant Washington. He really didn't. But he didn't correct you. So we know him now as George Washington Carver, but it wasn't his choice. So because Carver was young, he had you know, a respiratory problem, like called, you know, called pneumonia. Uh, he was very sickly as a child. And Moses and his wife Susan allowed George to pretty much spend his time in the garden, in the forest, with flora and the fauna, the trees, the frogs, the birds. They were his playmates. Now, here's the question about Carver. If you spend your early life as a child in a garden, on a farm, with the streams, the birds, the flowers, and you've become this magnanimous scientist? Why aren't we as a culture putting our kids in the environment that Carver excelled in? Why do we keep them locked into a building all day, sit down, be quiet, and wonder why they have any in this? Again, Carver's garden. So Susan and, and Moses taught Carver to read and write, taught him this sense of spirituality, faith, and love of what we call nature. But he was hungry for more than what they could provide him. This young dude at 12 years old, 12 years old, with his parents' permission, walked 10 miles to, to Neosha, which was the nearest segregated, then called covered school. 12 years old, walked 10 miles, left home to go to school. It's an amazing story. Here's like how those rooms look, look like. I was out um, oh, a couple days ago with my dear friend uh, from News Graphic, uh, Spencer Mahan, and we were visiting with the, um, the Stadiumville uh, Rosenwald School in the church there. And then quite a bit of work as well, reading and researching on other schools around the state. 
and we have to do some things to honor those traditions and make those structures come alive and make them part of our legacy in here in Scott County. But then he went on to high school as well, and he was 21 years old when he graduated from high school. 21 years old. He was determined, he had this thirst for knowledge and wisdom. He had to keep seeking it. But what he did then, like many folks did back then, he went to Kansas. He said, yeah, you can go out, to, you can pay like $5, you know, $10. You can get like, you know, 30, 40, 100 acres. Become a farmer. That's what he did. And thankfully, he failed at farming back then. That failure allowed him, inspired him then to go on the Simpson College, Iowa State, and Tuskegee. Sometimes failure can be a good thing. So he was like what you call a sod buster, about three years. And then they built their homes on the side. Okay? The real thing, side bust. But he failed. And then he, 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 some friends of his inspired him then to uh, enroll at Simpson College in 1890. Now, Simpson College is named for this guy, Bishop Matthew Simpson, who was a good friend. who was a good friend of Abraham Lincoln. <coughs> Matter of fact, don't believe me, if you go to the uh, Google and do a search about who gave the eulogy to Abraham Lincoln's theory, Matthew Simpson. So I'm talking about all these ancestral vibrations that guided Carver along the way. Lincoln's influence wasn't just Emancipation Proclamation and the brother may of the Europeans following in Lincoln's footsteps. Oh. It's all good though. So anyway, that was Simpson College. And he went there to study art. Now, he said, well, because he loved, his first love was art, painting in particular. He spent two years there at Simpson studying art, because when he was a kid, when he was a kid, he made his brushes from twigs. He would mash them up like this, okay? And then he would take pork berries, elderberries, and things like that, for his paint palettes and paint and clay, what he did. He went to, uh, what the time is here? Oh, I'm going to get out here. But a teacher said, you know, they asked him, how many black men do you see making a living doing art in 1890? None. Exactly. So she encouraged him to go to Iowa State to study agriculture. He did that. While he was there, he worked. One of his professors was a guy named Henry A. Wallace, who became later, in 1900, the Secretary of Agriculture that year. While he was in Iowa, Henry A. Wallace's son, Henry C. Wallace, was a, was a kid, recovered, befriended as a, as a kid and taught him all about gardening and, and, and you know, nature, whatever. Then Henry C. Wallace became like his father, Secretary of Agriculture, and also Vice President. So Carver knew all the presidents, was friends with all the presidents. 1900, when he died, all the presidents called upon him. One of the results of his friendship with the presidents was what we call victory gardens. Some of you all probably like me are in here old enough to have experienced Victory Gardens. One of Carver's inspirations was Victory Gardens. Then he left Iowa, 
He got called by Booker T. Washington to come to Tuskegee. Okay, to save the black soils and black souls. He spent almost 50 years there. Incredible. He could speak to presidents and peasants. In 1898, his second bulletin was about nature study and schools. He was a proponent of school gardening in the 1890s. He helped foster the whole uh, progressive movement around nature study. So his garden began where his bullets, he did 44 bulletins on almost every subject you can think about. Now, I'm going to close out. I'm going to get kicked out of here. I want to give you all some things as well. I appreciate you all's patience this evening in all kinds of ways. Carver and Henry Ford collaborated a whole lot. There's a whole book called The Green Vision of Henry Ford and George Washington Carver. I recommend mayors, council, school people to get a copy of the library. Because if we had followed their vision, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in now. Their vision included all, pretty much everything of industrial manufacturing would be made from agricultural products grown by U.S. farmers. They were doing zero waste in the 30s, long before Toyota introduced zero waste. Bless our hearts. They were talking about biofuels. They were making car bodies from soybeans. When Ford died in the 30s, his son Edsel decided to go to big boys, the Exxon, the Shell, the Mobile, and addict us, if you want to call it that, to oil from other countries. And lots of waste and pollution. This fire we had in Ohio is an example of that. If we follow the vision, Four. So my question is, what are we waiting for? Why do we keep whitewashing these visions that are guideposts to the future? So I close with that and say thank you for being here. Love y'all much. Come and get some um, some peanuts, some seeds up here if you uh, if you know about elderberry. My farm, I, I cut some elderberry. Well, I some elderberries, some elderberries. This is um, a little here, and here's some um, figs. Uh, you want to read? Uh, I got another picture from Brother Mayor here, okay? The proclamation kitchen. This is like a photo op for kids, okay? It's the mayor now, okay? Uh, whatever. <laughs> thank the library, thank kids for all our help, everybody else. Back go home safely. Love y'all very much.